Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Jerusalem Sunday, from my living room to your living room. We're delighted to be celebrating the seventh Sunday of Easter in this glorious season. And today I'm dressing down in my Franciscan gear. This is my Franciscan collared t-shirt, and this is my Jerusalem cross from my pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the year 2013. And uh, today we're doing it sim uh, with a little more simplicity. Number one, it's in the spirit of St. Francis to do things with simplicity. He was always in favor of dressing down. The other thing is that uh, the Franciscans are the guardians of the holy sites uh, of the land of the Holy One. And they've always had a very special role, not only in protecting and uh, being present in their prayers throughout the land of Israel-Palestine, but also uh, to be at the center of reconciliation, dialogue and understanding, especially between Christians, Jews and Muslims. So in that spirit I come to us today with my own Franciscan vis vision and rule of life to be a guardian of the languages of the Holy One of that land. And so, uh, just to introduce you, I've got my piano in front of me here. We're going to be singing some songs. Uh, we'll have a few from the guitar. I'll sing a little in Hebrew. And uh, we have here our kind of uh, table altar space as well. So our service today is to be found on our website, oneopencircle.org forward slash Sunday at 10. And if you scroll right down to the bottom and click there, you'll have access to the full order of service with the complete text for all of our songs, hymns, prayers, and readings. And that's where we'll be going next. So I invite you, for those of you who have that, uh, to open to page three of that document as I continue to welcome us and for us to gather. My name's Andrew Twitty. I'm uh, the Rector and Incumbent of St. Anne and St. Edmund Parksville, and uh, I'm isolating at home right now for reasons of health and safety for a few more days. God willing, we'll pass that final test, and I'll be able to go out into the, uh, the world beyond my own property, so to speak, soon. So in this time and place, many of us are gathering online from our homes on the ancestral territories of the Pentlatch-speaking peoples the forebears of the Qualicum and Snonawas First Nations, and in the lands and watersheds of the Kwakwakiwak, New Channel, and Coast Salish peoples. Good morning and welcome. Gilakashla, Kleko Klako, Heishtepka. From many places and peoples, we come to this house in prayer. We gather in the name of the living God. We meet in the presence of Jesus, God's anointed, risen and alive. We gather with the community of faith around the globe and across the ages. In this time and place, heaven and earth are one. We are no longer alone. We are one in Christ. We are knit together in the unity of the Spirit. In the name of the Holy and Blessed One, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In a time of quietness, let us center ourselves in openness to the Spirit of God at work within and among us. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. May grace and peace be with you. May Christ fill our hearts with joy. 
Let us pray. Giver of eternal life, send us to your world to speak the truth of peace, to stand with those who suffer, and to show another way. Through Jesus, the Anointed One, the life of all things. Amen. We're going to have an opening hymn of celebration, and you might, you might find uh, that uh, I'm weaving a few of my sermon thoughts or stories, which is really what I want to do, just to, to tell a few stories today uh, about Jerusalem and the land of the Holy One as we, uh, we gather. So I've had three, uh, two visits, sorry, to the land of the Holy One. In 1982, I made my first pilgrimage, and I have distinct memories of uh, looking forward with ante anticipation, going on the bus up to Galilee, to the scene of Jesus' Galilean ministry, and being surrounded by tanks and guns uh, rolling up the hill towards the beginning of the Lebanese War in 1982. In 2013, my second visit and pilgrimage uh, with Richard Lasseur and uh, with the college and cathedral there at St. George's in Jerusalem, we were also in anticipation of the rising amount of tension and warfare and outbreak of violence that was happening around Jerusalem and throughout the land. And uh, so this is the context also today for our gathering, that we celebrate Jerusalem, the mother of us all, and we do so in awareness of the pain and suffering that surrounds that beautiful place. And uh, we're going to begin with uh, a celebration. This Thursday, uh, just past Ascension Day, was the installation of our new Archbishop in the Diocese of Jerusalem, uh, Hosam. And uh, we are so delighted uh, to celebrate. I was able to witness a little bit of it online. So let's sing this Ascension and Easter hymn. This comes from a, a Southern melody uh, from the gospel tradition of the Southern states. Come away to the skies, my beloved arise. For those of you with hymn books, it's number 225 in the Anglican hymn book, Common Praise. <laughs>
Our first reading comes to us from the book of Acts. There is more than one way to choose a new leader. Peter stood up among the believers, and together the crowd numbered about 120 persons, and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit, through David, foretold concerning the betrayer who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which the betrayer turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Holy word, holy wisdom, Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Our song is a, our reflective song is a song uh, that is a prayer for peace. This comes from the Sufi tradition, and so I want to give credit to my mentor in that tradition of the dances of universal peace, to Joanne Sales, and to the whole community of Dances of Universal Peace for the wisdom and beauty of this prayer. I won't be dancing it today, but we will be singing it. You're welcome to dance at home. It goes like this. Peace to the children of Israel. Peace to the children of Ishmael. Peace to the children of all the world. All the world shall live in peace. Shalom, which is Hebrew. Salam, which is Arabic, Shalom, Salam, all the world shall live in peace. In this time of great tension that affects Jews, Christians, and Muslims in an intense way throughout the Middle East, especially at this time, we pray for peace with our songs and with our hearts and with our voices. Just 
just as we celebrate the Sufi and Muslim tradition, so we celebrate the Jewish roots of all of our monotheistic faiths of, of Judaism that leads into this branching out into Christian and Muslim expressions of faith. We celebrate the deep ecumenism that connects us at heart and spirit. Our psalm appointed for the day is Psalm 1. This is what it looks like in uh, the scholarly version of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and I'm going to be singing that to us in Hebrew. But first of all, uh, I'll give us the rabbi's translation. So this is Rabbi uh, Zalman Shachter Shalomi's translation, Psalms in a translation for praying. And uh, uh, Rab Zell was known for being uh, very deeply connected to Thomas Merton and to many others across all spectrums where he worked very deeply. And uh, so we honor his life and ministry in the reading of this psalm as well. Psalm 1. In bliss is the person who does not seek the advice of the spiteful, who does not stand on the path of the wayward, who does not associate with those who disparage everything, but whose longing is for the guidance of Yah, who keeps pondering it day and night. Such a person is like a tree at the confluence of rivers that gives fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wilt. All that such a person does is appropriate. Not so are the malicious ones who drift like chaff in the wind. Therefore the wicked cannot stand justice. Nor do the wayward feel at home when the just ones gather to bear witness. This is how Yah looks at the righteous ones, but the way of the spiteful leads to their doom. I've been trying to live into the world of the Psalms these past two winters as I've been uh, attached to Holy Trinity Funchal in Madeira, and so uh, what I hope for myself is that I'm able to take a psalm, which was the hymn book of Jesus, of course, and try and live into it. So if in the moment I just said, okay, let's see if I can at least get the first three verses. Let's see where we get. Ki im betorat Adonai chefso, u torato yehge yomam valayla. Vehaya ka'etz, shatul al palgemayim, eshe pirio yiten li etto, ve alea. Everything that the person planted by the riverside does is going to flourish. So I pray for our flourishing, our wisdom, our ability to turn away from the pathways of spitefulness and malice and embrace the ways of justice and truth. As the psalmist so wonderfully says in his first uh, opening psalm, and as we try to sing, I'm going to sing this to um, an ancient Hebrew melody that is attached to a 14th century Jewish text called the Yigdal of uh, uh, Daniel ben Yehuda. So, and it goes something like this. <laughs>
Our gospel hymn is Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. This is a song that comes to us through uh, the tradition of the Sisters of St. John the Divine uh, in Canada in their guardianship of the words of Frank Mason North, who lived actually in New York City. So his hymn expresses that particular vast city's sense of aching pain. And today I would like us to turn towards the city of Jerusalem to hear again the cries of tribe and race resounding, to feel the children's wounded helplessness, to feel the compassion of Jesus and the tears which I believe he still sheds over Jerusalem and all places around it. So that we look forward to a time when peace and justice shall descend upon earth as the heavenly city foursquare itself. The hymn is number 592, if you're following in your hymn book, hymn number 592. Oh 
helplessness, from men and women's grief and toil, from famished souls, from sorrow's stress, your heart has never known recoil. The cup of water given for you still holds the freshness of your grace, yet long the multitudes to view the strong compassion of your face. from John's Gospel in Jesus' High Priestly Prayer, beginning in the 17th chapter. Our true self is one with God. Jesus prays for us to know this, since this knowledge will protect us. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Jesus, the Anointed One. Jesus lifted his eyes in prayer and said, Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your Son, so the Son in turn may show your bright splendor. I spelled out your character in detail to the men and women you gave me. They were yours in the first place, then you gave them to me. And they have now done what you said. They know now, beyond the shadow of a, a doubt, that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them. And they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the systems of the world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours, and yours mine. And my life is on display in them, for I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me so that they can be one in heart and mind as we are one in heart and mind. Now I'm returning to you and I'm saying these things in the world's hearing so my people can experience my joy completed in them. I gave them your word, the systems of the world hated them because of it, because they didn't join the world's ways, just as I didn't join the world's ways. 
I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the system than I am defined by the system. So make them wholly consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. Holy word, holy wisdom, the gospel of the anointed one. Praise to you, Jesus, the anointed one. Outside of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, there stands a church that in Latin is called Dominus Flavit, or the Lord wept. It's the site of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. If you go out and look towards the eastern wall, the gate uh, that is blocked up, and uh, if you're across the valley on the Mount of Olives, you can find the place where a church has been designed uh, in the 1950s, actually, by an Italian architect in the shape of a teardrop. So it's small, and yet it captures this sense of Jesus' deep pain and identification with the sufferings of his people. The place that he loves the most, in a sense. Jerusalem, his home. Yes, he's from Nazareth. Yes, he's from Galilee. But he comes up to partake in the feasts at the temple. He comes, as we know, as a 12-year-old, but throughout life to these special times, events, and seasons to fully fulfill the law as a good Jewish boy and young man. And at the same time, he weeps over the brokenness of his compromised society occupied by Romans, compromised by collaborating Herodians and unjust use of power. And he cries in pain. And Jesus cries in pain today for the divisions of our society and especially for the land of the Holy One. Jerusalem is divided not only in two to East and West Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is essentially, it's part of the West Bank. If you take uh, the line and see how the Arab population and the uh, Christian community of Anglican Arab speaking are contained within that part and West Jerusalem uh, is the side that is uh, essentially the Jewish community's home. So there's this very visible division. The, the city itself, the old city of Jerusalem, is split four ways. We think of Jerusalem as standing four square, and it's four square, but it's divided. You know, this Jerusalem cross, if I come a little closer, you see it, uh, presents to us that four square image, that there's one big cross with the four crosses all around it. And not only does that represent a perfect balance uh, of holding together heaven and earth and holding together um, vertically and uh, horizontally all aspects of material human existence and community and diversity and uh, the up and down of our lives, the, the divine and the human are held together. And yet they are not only held together but divided. Inside of that holy city, the walled city of ancient Jerusalem, the old city, we have four quarters. The Christian quarter over here, site of the Holy Sepulchre, the place in tradition of Jesus' death and resurrection, are all in this area. The Jewish quarter over uh, here, the Armenian quarter, Orthodox uh, specific branch of Christian experience, and then the Muslim quarter. And in this corner over here, these two parts, you come to the Temple Mount, the holiest site within Judaism. And upon that, you get the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque, which for 1400 years of Islam has been the third holiest site within Islam. So all these holy sites of uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are all in this one space and yet divided into different corners. And as we know from this week's news, tensions continue to arise. And our own Archbishop was enthroned 
in a context of rubber bullets and rocket fire, and our hearts break. I went on Facebook for, uh, to, to connect with Peter Starr. Now, he was a young boy in, in, uh, along with my kids in church 30 years ago. Uh, now he's a dancer in Israel, and I had the privilege of sharing with a rabbi in conducting his wedding ceremony here in Nanaimo. And Peter uh, posted just this week a picture of rocket fire in uh, Tel Aviv, Yafo, Jaffa, where he lives, coming through the building uh, nearby and uh, seeing the blackened out um, building. And he said there's riots every night. This part of Jaffa where I myself have uh, spent time uh, and have mingled with the people, which has traditionally been a place where uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims have had a higher level of positive interaction in community, has been a source of intense and growing unrest. And Peter posted, as we pray for him and Ophir and all our friends and people we know and love throughout the land of the Holy One, Peter posted, they're at it again, both sides, and there are no winners in war. There are no winners in this war. And so I feel with him because he sits under the shadow of that. I've lived for a week and rented a, a little apartment there. And the one thing I remember about the apartment is in the center of it, there was this massive uh, door that weighed a ton. And when you open it, it went into a, an enclosed space. And I, of course, it's the bomb shelter. When you hear the sound, you go, the alarm sound, you go into your bomb shelter in the middle of your apartment, you close the doors and windows, and you stay there until it's safe. Our Presbyterian school in Jaffa, uh, I, again, I grew up partly connected to the Church of Scotland, so uh, the person responsible for all the Presbyterian schools there in, uh, in Israel at that time was someone who was a friend of someone I'd been to seminary with uh, 35 years ago. So we spent a little time together. He invited me into the school. What they do in that Church of Scotland school is that they very intentionally have um, an equal mix of Jews, Christians, and Muslims as children together, learning to play together, learning to learn together learning to grow up together and understand their histories and backgrounds and differences. And yet as you walk through the entranceway, as I walked through those eight years ago into that space, it wasn't the diversity that struck me first of all, or the mediating role that Christians have as a 2% minority in Israel and Palestine. It was the fact that the sign glared at me Please be quiet, exams taking place in the bomb shelter. That meant downstairs. I thought, oh, I never had to go to school like that. And next to it was the warning sign with its little ditty, hear the shrill, know the drill. And that means when you hear the sound of warning, go into the bomb shelter. This has been true also in Gaza, where this week, Israeli Defense Force has taken out even the press tower of the Associated Press and Al Jazeera, giving people one hour's notice to flee before destruction of the building. And there are children and women and men who have died as civilian casualties in this process. There are people dying both sides of lines. There are no winners in warfare. There's only multiplied hurt. So we join our voices in prayer in lifting up the role that both Franciscans and Christians today throughout the Holy Land have undertaken. In our cathedral in Jerusalem, there's a program called Kids for Peace. You can look them up, Kids for number four, peace.org. They seek to bring together young people in Jerusalem and throughout the country 
who will go to summer camp together, who will learn together, who will share stories and understand and seek to be bridge builders and peacemakers within that conflicted zone. So we continue to uphold the task of reconciliation. We continue to uphold the staying of the hands of destruction and the search for a lasting and just peace. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He comes down from the mountainside of the Mount of Olives, sweating out his pain, not only crying at that deep moment of intensity for him, but in the Garden of Gethsemane itself, under the pressure of the world, the screws of suffering squeezing out the wine press of what he must drink as his cup of suffering. So as we celebrate Jerusalem Sunday, we look to the sacrifice of Christ. We look to the sufferings and the compassion of Jesus. And we identify as he does with the pain and the suffering around. And we lift them all up to God today in ways that are beyond our words, yes, with our words, with our songs, with our scriptures. And we learn with Jesus that our greatest protection, and this is something that Jews, Christians, and Muslims can all know from our own deepest mystical traditions, that we are already at one with God. That our truest self can neither be harmed nor do harm because it is encased in this cradle of divine love that exists beyond all of our experiences of either joy or sorrow. And Jesus prays that the systems of the world which demand competition and warfare and victory and exclusion be overcome by this sense of inner unity. And I pray that all of our faiths, this day in Jerusalem, throughout the Middle East and the world, may learn to live into this deep space of oneness, that we may truly know our heart's home in God, the beloved, the one of 99 names of Allah, the one of 72 names of the Hebrew tradition, and the one beyond all names whom we call Trinity, Jesus, and so many more names for spirit and God that are coming to us through our scriptures that we'll see the underlying lying unity of the one God who holds us all together. Amen. We'll take a time of quiet reflection for prayer.
affirm our faith together in the words of the Hear, O Israel, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. As we come to our prayers today, uh, I have a little innovation in our worship. This is a basket of offering, and as we've been lifting up the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, so we lift up our prayers. And I have here um, our parish list with all the names of those who are members and associates that we are praying for today. I have here all of the special concerns of our, not only our uh, community partners, but our wider church, all those for whom we're praying as we come to our litany in just a moment. And I place these in the basket as well. And in this basket of offering, I've also got, uh, this, this is my uh, phone case, and in it I keep a, a list of all the people who've asked me for prayer. So on my daily prayers and today on Sunday, I place this in here. And finally, I also keep in it um, a, uh, my debit card. So in this uh, basket is a symbol of all that we are giving as a community, not just myself, but on behalf of everyone in our community, who in this time when we are isolated and at home and not gathering in community uh, beyond the online community, many of you I know are uh, giving through electronic means to support God's mission in the world and in our parish. And I honor those gifts, not just mine, but everyone who's giving and lift those up to God, because all things come to us from God. We return to God and we return these symbols of God's gifts to us. Let us pray. Loving God, accept our praises, our prayers, and our thanksgivings in the name of the one beyond all names, creating, redeeming, and sustaining. Amen. Let us pray to God the Holy Spirit, saying, Come, Holy Spirit, come. Our prayers are on page 14 of your leaflet, electronic leaflet. Come, Holy Spirit, hear us as we pray for the Church here and everywhere, for our bishops and leaders, for our clergy and teachers, for the Anglican Communion around the world, and particularly today for the Church in Jerusalem, for Archbishop Hosam Naum, and the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, and Bishop Ibrahim Azar, and the Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land that all may proclaim your word of peace and reconciliation. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, hear us as we pray for justice and peace on earth. For leaders of this country of Canada and for leaders of all the nations, particularly remembering today Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. May peace and harmony abundantly bless these achingly beautiful and historic places of your creation. O oh God, come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, hear us as we pray for the holy city of Jerusalem. Bring to those who lead Jewish, Muslim, and Christian communities a spirit of cooperation and collaboration, as this ancient and blessed city continues to be holy for us all. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, be with all those in need. We pray for victims of war and violence, for refugees and prisoners, for all who are afflicted or oppressed, that they may be held in your healing power. We pray for those who have died, especially those 
who have died through violence this past week, that they may live eternally in God's presence, and for those who mourn, that they may be comforted. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray this day for all who suffer from coronavirus through illness, loneliness, or anxiety. We pray for all those known to us and who have asked our prayers, and in the silence we lift them up to God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And we gather all our prayers and praises into one in the words of the simplicity prayer, the prayer Jesus gave us in the tradition of Claire and Francis. Our beloved, your energy is compassionate and unique. We want everyone to be aware of this. We want everything to share in this. Restore all things to be in harmony on the outside and on the inside. Give us what we really need now for today and for each day. Free us from the harm we have done and help us in our journey of recovery to release those who have harmed us. Keep us safe during our times of distress and release us from oppression. For your purpose, your strength and your glory is to bring together everyone and everything. We are depending on this we are committed to this. From my home to your home, from satellite to soul, the peace of God be always with you and also with you. Our doxology we say together. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 388 in your hymn book, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. This is a meditation on Psalm 87, verse 3. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. I'd like to try and uh, do a little recovery work on the hymn tune that was written by Haydn, Franz Joseph Haydn, and uh, was put to other uses in the last century, which may, ha may have evocations for other people as the German national anthem. So I'd like to do a task of recovery on that song, and if it's a bridge too far for you to listen to that tune, it's okay to go with blessing now. But uh, let's live into the beauty of that music and the wonder of that psalm and the words of John Newton as we sing Verses 1, 2, and 4, glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God, number 388.
peace, to love and to serve. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.